very few kids still follow. That should be well. So, anyways, uh, thank you, and for brother Brian, if you're ready, then to our dear sister Alison to uh, to be able to take it up. Welcome. Okay. Uh, Are you ready then? Is it recording? Just give me a moment so that I can. Okay, no problem. Yeah. No problem. Take your time. Just let me know whenever you're ready. That'll be fine. Okay. So we're just waiting for the recording to start and we'll begin. But I want to welcome everyone for coming and uh, glad to see you here, including uh, my friends here in from the United States. We have Thomas and Jean here. It's, so it's good to see Tom, both of you here as we, well. Are we handling uh, help with difficult marriages? Yes, this is a big topic, but hopefully we will um, touch on some key, key points here today. So it's help with difficult marriages. And so we're just, is it recording now? Oh, we are, okay, we are. Okay, sorry about that, I didn't see that. <laughs> All right, so again, welcome. My name is Allison Stevens and I welcome each of you to our our last session here and uh, my third session and uh, we're going to be talking about help with difficult marriages and uh, that's a big topic that's a because marriages are so varied and so have so many dynamics but before we start I want us to start with prayer because it's we need to do that so let's bow our heads please if you would Dear Father in heaven, I just ask as I begin this last talk that your Holy Spirit be with me and be with each person that is listening to the live stream now, as well as those who will be listening via recordings later on. Lord, we're talk tackling a topic that is about your divine institution, about marriage. And we know that we have, there's a lot of difficult marriages out there and we need your help. We're totally dependent on you. And so as I go through the material that's prepared, I ask for your Holy Spirit to uh, give me the right words to say that will meet the needs of the people and quicken my mind, give me wisdom and clarity. And please work on, send your Holy Spirit to work on each person's heart as they listen to these words today. And all glory goes to you for you've done so much for us. We're so appreciative of your blessings and of the spirit of prophecy in the Bible that we can refer to for our for guidance. So I just ask for your blessing today. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to get a little drink here. I want to start out by looking at um, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. I think it's a good way to start out this, this topic of difficult marriages. And I'm going to show you my Bible. People who know my Bible, it's always marked up. Um, but here, let me just show this to you. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. It's talking about the works of the work of the flesh and works of the spirit. Now the works of the flesh are manifested, which are these: adultery, fornication, 
uncleanness and lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that which, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. You know, as I was reading these texts here, and I was thinking about all of the complexities of marriage, and what is the root cause of these things, that troubles that we do have. And I was looking, I thought, wow, you know, these things do, you know, provoking, envying, jealousy, um, you know, hatred, idolatry, variance, all of these things contribute to difficult marriages. And I was looking through, and you can do this as well, um, I was looking through uh, Mrs. White's writings, and as you know, online you can find where she wrote thousands and th thousands of letters over her lifetime and uh, you can actually print these print these off from online and just look up the keywords do a keyword search on marriage and just start looking and we were we were reading through these letters that she sent to various people last night and the heart breaking situations that they were in but you and a lot of these things were on previously unpublished. So you're not going to find these in any of the Spirit of Prophecy books. But I would encourage you to read through these. And <clears throat> let me just make myself a note here. I will send a SOP study document to um, Brother Zadok that's on marriage, and that'll help you find these easily. And uh, let me just show you one thing that when I send out, when you do use our tools here to find Spirit of Prophecy quotes, let me just show you one thing that will help you. Um, let's see how, how these work. So for example, because we use these all the time, Okay, you can see my, my screen here. <clears throat> I did a search on abuse and marriage. And I found a few uh, quotes about that. Pro paragraphs where uh, the two words were mentioned in that paragraph. So I'll send one over to about just the word marriage. And, that, and when you're reading these on these PDFs, uh, one tool that I want you to be aware of is right here beneath each quote you will see <clears throat> a reference in blue writing. So for example, uh, this is testimony number 18 that was for here. This is second testimony, volume two, page 472. When you, when, if you have this on your computer uh, or your phone, I think it'll work too. If you click on it, it will take you directly to the EG White website and I'll take you to that complete document. And so I encourage people when they see things, uh, these little, from our reports like this that we send out, when you see something that looks appealing to you, click on that blue link and that'll take you to the full document and you will find so many gems in those documents. And if you wanna print them, you can print them. Uh, there's a little print button here and you can actually print the whole document like right there. So I would encourage you to use these tools that uh, I've been sharing in the past. Uh, last night I shared some, and then tonight I will share some as well. 
But anyway, uh, Mrs. White did write uh, a number, so many, so many um, letters, and I'd encourage people to read them because there's no way that I can cover every single marriage issue in our limited time that we have together. But I would encourage people to read through these because you may see yourself in some of these. You may see friends in some of these. And uh, uh, she explains, you know, she does give some advice in them too. Um, she has letters to uh, Jay and Andrews, Uriah Smith and his wife. Um, it was amazing what she was shown and the counsel that she was given. But before we go on, I want to, I got a lot of things here, different things to show you. And truly the root of all sin, where did it come from? Let's talk about that. Because, you know, in heaven, the angels don't have the problems we have down here. They are sinless. They are sanctified. They're holy. And sanctification and holiness is a is what we should each of us be going through now on a daily basis where our characters are being changed by the power of God, which only comes through us surrendering completely and totally to him. But where did this trouble come from? And when you trace it all the way back, the trouble comes from Lucifer comes from pride now if i was to uh if any if i was to go to my husband and say now honey i'm going to fix you and change you and you know fix all your problems well that wouldn't probably go over really well <laughs> and the thing is to understand in our marriages we all have very unique uh circumstances situations we come from various backgrounds uh, with, you know, lots of different uh, things that have happened in our past lives before we came together. And the one thing that we can change and have control over is ourselves. That's the one thing, um, yes, we can come together and talk about things. So, but we need to first deal with ourselves. When we get married, as much as we prepare for marriage, when we get married, neither one of us is perfect. You know, I have quirks, I have faults, I have strength, I have skills. Um, but if you ask my husband if I'm perfect, he would say, no, no. But as you go through marriage, you learn to get along and adjust for each other. And so I want to talk about, I want to talk about the root cause of people's marriages and i really believe that root cause comes from <clears throat> the issue of pride and pride is the one thing that requires that we need to have eradicated from our lives and when i say pride so mrs white says here pride is at the root of all sin and is the door that shuts out the spirit of God. So if we have Christian marriages, do we want to have the spirit of God shut out of our lives? Uh, no, we don't. Pride is a emotional. So what is pride? How do we define pride? Pride is a emotional response or attitude to something with an intimate connection to oneself due to perceived value. Perceived value may be due to your own abilities and achievements, maybe your looks, your family, your education. It uh, is pride is a lofty and often arrogant assumption of superiority in some respect. Think about conceit. It implies an exaggerated estimate, estimate of one's own abilities or attainments together with pride. Pride is an excessively high opinion of oneself, conceit, a feeling of entitlement. And pride can be a satisfaction or pleasure taking one's own self or even 
someone else's success and achievements. One of the saddest things that I ever heard one time was um, somebody confessed to me that they <laughs> they were um, they said, yeah, you really shouldn't. They said, you shouldn't really associate with me because I'm just, I am just, what they say? I'm just uh, using you for your, for social, for social gain. They were told, they told me because I was doing different types, types of singing. And that was a very sad day to hear that. But that was where that person got their pride from, was from what I was doing. And so pride is something that must be eradicated from our characters. There will be no pride. Now that, that does not mean self-respect and doing things uprightly and appropriately. No, pride is something above and beyond. And it drives our attitudes. It drives our behaviors. It drives our expectations of other people. Um, pride is usually all about me. Think about Lucifer, what happened with him? And, and pride is often means you're not content with yourself as you are, but you need, you have needs for others to see your superiority or your importance. And that can translate to our own families. Think about Lucifer. Lucifer was the ultimate example of pride. Sin originated with him. Pride led to his downfall. He was already, already he was the highest of all the angels. He was already one of the covering cherubs next to the throne of God. He had the glory of God covering him every day. He was already beautiful. He already had the respect of all of the heavenly host. And when, so when God said to his son, Jesus, let us make man in our image. This is in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. Lucifer was jealous of Jesus. He was filled with envy, jealousy, and hatred. Lucifer wanted, wished to be the highest in heaven. He wished to be next to God, and he wished to receive the highest honors. And if you read the account of Lucifer's fall in Patriarchs and Prophets, Chapter one, you will see where it says how God called all the heavenly hosts together. And because he and he and Jesus had been planning our world. And Lucifer wanted to be involved in the plans. And God said, no, it's just myself and my son. And that made Lucifer very angry and upset. And so God called all the heavenly hosts together and he sat jesus down there on his right side and he said to him he, he told all the angels he said whatever he tells you to do uh he, he was giving him a he was bestowing upon him a very great honor in this ceremony that he did and so he gave all authority to jesus and he and god instructed all of the angels and said now when I give him all of this authority. Whatever he tells you to do, you are to do it because he's carrying out my will. He's doing what I've asked him to tell you. So obey him as you would me. And so all of the angels were like, okay, except for Lucifer. He was jealous. He did not want, he did not. And they all bowed down to Jesus and, you know, understood this. And uh, Lucifer was very angry, very jealous. He bowed down too, but those, seed, those seeds of jealousy and hatred sprang up in him. He wanted that honor for himself. Even though he was already the highest of the angels, even though he was already next to the throne of God all of the time, even though he was the most beautiful angel and had all the respect of the heavenly host, he wanted more. And that's what pride does. It, it makes us unsatisfied with what we have, where we are at. And so until this time, all heaven was in order, harmony, in perfect harmony and perfect submission to the government of God. But Lucifer was now ambitious to exalt himself. 
that's what pride does. It's when pride is rising up, we want to be noticed. We want, you know, we want to have the attention of others. Um, he was unwilling to submit to the authority of Jesus. And so sin originated with him and also seeds of rebellion were within him. Think about those rebellious things, sins of seeds of rebellion. So what does this sin of pride cause us to do? Again, she says, as soon as pride enters the heart, the spirit of God is shut out. And if I want a Christian marriage, I cannot have, I need the spirit of God with us, with both of us and in our home. Let me just show you, this is a really good little article here. I'm going to turn on my document cam for a moment and show this to you. Um, it's from Review and Herald, 1855. It is on page six and it is from June 12th, 1855. For some reason, they used to stick her Mrs. White's articles way back on page six and page eight of the Review and Herald's, which I find interesting. But let's just take a look at a few of these, few of these statements here. Can you all see this? I wanna get this down here so that you can see this as well as possible. Um, all right. Move that here, sorry. There we go. It's just titled to the church. So this is Review and Herald, June 6, 1855. It's on page six of the PDF. You can download it off the internet. It is to be feared that the people of God are not prepared for what is coming upon the earth. Is there not a lack of energy in the church? Are we not upon the enchanted ground and falling asleep in this important time? We desire to walk too much by sight. We must walk more by faith. We must have more energy, more unwavering faith and confidence in God. And yes, this translates to our marriages, our daily lives. Has pride not crept into the church? Is there that close watchfulness of self that there should be? Let us, um, let us each examine our own hearts and look carefully to our own lives and see how they will compare with the true pattern who wore a plain, seamless coat. Jesus was not into fashion. He was not into appearance. He was here for a mission. He was here to show us the character of God and how we were to live and to die for our sins. He, was, he wore a plain, seamless coat whose life was a life of sacrifice, who went about doing good, doing others good, and making others happy. Let us search closely and see if we have the fruits of the Spirit. So if we don't have the Spirit of God in us individually and in our homes and in our families, we are not going to have those fruits of the Spirit. Those fruits of the Spirit, which we just read about, um, those are, those are the key to happiness and a smooth, smooth, um, home life. Again, just as soon as pride enters the heart, <clears throat> the spirit of God is shut out. Are there not those among us who indulge in pride and needless expense? I'm sorry. I need to just eat a, I need to fix my throat a little bit here. They will soon regret it. Are not those among us who indulge in pride and needless inspects, expense, they will soon regret it. <clears throat> For trying times are just before us and they will then need and desire to have the misspent means for they will feel want and pinching want will be all around them. While some indulge in pride and needless expense, some are on the opposite extreme 
and by their lives and appearance act as though neatness and order are pride and sin. This is not so. They can be neat and orderly and not have pride in their hearts. The poor can keep tidy as well as the more wealthy. They should not neglect their houses and persons, but should keep, but should be neat and cleanly. Their dwellings should be kept neat and order. And then the servants of God can find pleasure in coming to their houses and kneeling upon the floors to ask the blessing of the holy and pure God to rest upon them. Ask yourself today, can that happen in my home right now? If I was in my home right now, could I have people come in right now, kneel upon my floor and together ask the Lord's for the Lord's blessings and to help us? Just think about it. God is a God of order. And those who suffer themselves to be unclean and disorderly deprive themselves of many blessings they might otherwise enjoy. Filthiness among God's people, professed people, is displeasing to him. Our God is a jealous God. He will have a clean, pure, and holy people. A filthy and unclean person will he will not acknowledge as his child you ever thought about that if your home is mess messy and not clean that, that that he will not acknowledge you those who profess to be converted of god and take upon themselves the name of christians or christ-like should be the neatest people in the world it is a dishonor to god and a stain upon his cause to profess to be converted to God and the truth and yet go with slack, untidy habits that are uncorrected. Such must have a reformation and their conversation must be more thorough. The fruits of religion are not disorder and, uncleanly, and uncleanness. Those who, have, those who have had no ambition to appear in a becoming manner before their brethren and sisters should, for Christ's sake and for the sake of the truth, take bold, uh, take hold of the work in earnest and thorough reform. So, marriage problems can arise from all kinds of things. A lot of it can arise from just the management of the home. Is the home clean? Is the home tidy? Is the home maintained? It's, that can be very difficult if both people are working and with kids. Um, let's look at some more things here about what pride causes us to do. So I was making some notes early this morning about what pride does. I was thinking about a tree. And if you, have, if you had a picture of a tree and if you saw a great big huge tree and if you could see underground all of the roots of that tree. You would be a very extensive root system. But that tree that flourishes is based on that root system. Now, if you would imagine for a moment that that tree, that tree that you have in your mind's eye, great big tree, if that root system is all pride, what would that tree produce? And if you were to put labels on the branches, here's some of the things that you would see. It causes selfishness. Uh, and how does this show in our in how does and how does this show in our lives and our marriages? Selfishness, um, spending, debt, manipulation. That's how it can manifest itself. Uh, covetousness, discontent with what I have. I want that over there. I want that shiny new thing. I want that shiny new car. I want that big house. I want this. I notice how I keep saying I. I has to do a lot with selfishness. And covetousness. There can be resentfulness where one partner of the marriage is, is resentful of the other. Well, why can't you why can't you provide this for me? Don't you want me to be happy? Didn't you marry me to make me happy? Not, a, not the right attitude that we want to have. 
Um, for that reason alone, that is why we need to have make sure that both partners are fully involved in the management of the finances of the home. So they understand what money comes in and they understand what money goes out and how much it costs to maintain a home. And so, and there's, so there's good reasons why we can't, I mean, if we don't have that, you know, one might say, well, why can't I have that nice pretty red car over there? Why can't I have that bigger house over there? Well, it's a matter of math. Money that comes in versus money that goes out. And we have to live within our means. Something else that happens with pride. The neglect of another's, the other person's needs. It be, can be just in consideration of their needs. Just, you know, why do you need that? You know, um, depending on the temperaments. Uh, the man might be very overbearing. The lady might be more quiet and assuming, and she might have needs and, and think, well, you know, this month I would really like to get this because I need it. But he doesn't ever stop and ask her, honey, is there something that you need? You know, is there anything that's on your mind before we <clears throat> spend the money? And oftentimes her needs go neglected. Jealousy. Pride. I was reading a tragic letter last night. I don't know which one it was here. Uh, tragic letter last night about jealousy. Maybe I have it here. And this is it. Let me just read a few of these words. Jealousy is terrible distress on, on, a, on a person. This is a letter to... Wait a minute. This was a letter to Sister Howland. And I don't think it's the same Howlands that were living in Maine. Sister Howland, she says, um, Mrs. White says to her, I saw you watching your husband with a sort of jealous fear. His heart was devoted to you. Yet you feared he would think too much of others who had no claim to his affections. These words were then repeated to me. There was great fear no fear was. That is, your fears were groundless. Yet this fear has been with you through your married life. You have passed through many hours of unnecessary suffering, scrutinizing the words and acts of your husband with a censoring mind and putting a wrong construction upon them. Satan was ever ready to do his part to aid on the work and mar the happiness of a family which might have been complete. I saw this spirit of jealousy was as cruel as the grave and caused estrangement of feeling between husband and wife. In the time the children very often, in time the children very often understood the mother's feelings. Her sadness and troubled, troubled awakened sympathy in their hearts. And they see alike generally with the mother and become separated in a greater or less degree from the father. All this unhappiness was borrowed. Satan has magnified innocent words into acts unto a fault. I was shown, although a couple were married and gave themselves to each other by a most solemn vow in the sight of heaven and holy angels, and the two were one, yet each had a separate identity which the marriage covenant could not destroy. Although bound to one another, yet each has an influence to exert in the world. And they should not be so selfishly engrossed with each other as to shut themselves away from the society and bury up their usefulness and influence. So two things going on here. Even though when you were married, we come together as one, we still each have individual personalities. We still have talents and gifts that God has given us. And if you remember the, the parable about the talents, God gives each one of us talents and he expects that we will improve them. That's the purpose of that, that parable. So the wife has talents, the husband has talents, the, and we aren't all given the same number of talents. Some may, some people are given more talents 
and some people may be given one talent and that and we don't compare one to the other because that's not it's not if you have more talents you're better than the one that has one talent that's not how god evaluates it he looks at each person individually and we have an accountability to him to improve on the talent that he gave us so that includes the wife and the husband and he expects and as we show that we can handle the talents and we're improving the things that he's given us the skills and talents and gifts he will give us more but never never uh, it should never be a situation where the the one person's um, identity is just swallowed up by the other person's identity each person needs to be able to stand alone and also and to contribute and god expects this of us although bound to one another yet each has an influence to exert to the world we're not here living just unto our own selves and to our own happiness and our own satisfaction and our own desires and wants and needs jesus died for us so and we consider ourselves and we say we're christians following in his path but what does that mean was Jesus working to gain all of the riches of the world? Or was he working for the salvation of other souls? Now, you might say, yeah, but I, I have a, I got, went and got my education. I, you know, graduated from a university and I, um, you know, went into this profession. And what am I going to do about that? You know, you may find the Lord is calling, may find the Lord calls you completely out of that work to go into his vineyard you might say well i don't have a university degree to do to do evangelism or ministry or anything like that you know the thing is is in the last days uh, let me see if i can find this here in the last days who is god going to use to finish up the final work let me show this to you in case you've never seen this this is a spirit of prophecy volume four it's also known as the 1884 Great Controversy, which I highly suggest everybody read and study. It's not the same as the 88 in the 1911 one. This is the one that was intended for the Adventists to study. The 1988, not, not 18, the 1888 and the 1911 Great Controversies, those books were intended for the public. This one, published under the title eight, uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, this is the one intended for the Adventists to study, you and me. There's chapters in here that are not in those other books, including all of the chapters on the three angels' messages. But let me show you who's going to do the work. And I'm, and I'm sharing this with you because this happened to me. I had another career. <laughs> I was in healthcare for decades. I, you know, went to, went to Loma Linda and got my, you know, education worked in healthcare for many years god pulled me out of it but let me just show this to you who is he god going to use in these final days and i have one dear friend right now who is who said to me several years ago he said allison i want to go to come to the united states and i think he lives in you might live in Kenya. I'm not sure. Um, he says, I want to come to the United States and go to school there so that I can be a minister. And I said, no, don't. And I showed him this. I wonder if he still remembers this. I'll have to ask him. But I showed him this. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. What does it say? This is page 424. Here it is. Thus will the message of the third angel be proclaimed. At the, as the time comes for the loud cry to be given, the Lord will work through humble instruments, meaning people, leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. So it doesn't matter where you are, 
doesn't matter what your education level is. God is going to use people who are humble. They're, they, the, they have overcome the pride issue and who consecrate themselves to his service. Those are the people God is going to use in these last days to, to finish the work. So don't ever feel, and he doesn't say it's just men. He says humble instruments includes women. And there are women out there, not trying to be pastors, but men, women like myself that are just, you know, teaching, just sharing. Women have the ability to do a lot of work too. And I'm not promoting women as pastors because I don't believe in that. That's not biblical. But teaching, yes, women can do that. Um, so keep that in mind. Let's, let's go on here. She says, back to this, this, this sad account here about this, this, um, these people. Many cases have been shown me in vision where the first evil seed sown in the family was an expression, a look, or an act of doubt on the part of the wife in regard to her husband's love or his attentions. Nothing can, nothing can wound a man of integrity like this to know that she who has given him her hand has given her life's happiness into his keeping distrusts him. And that he has not her entire confidence that his words, his goings out, his comings in are watched with uneasiness and jealousy that he cannot act without restraint um, in the society of friends who visit him, that he cannot be cheerful, happy or social with friends that an eye is upon him and that he must act guardedly and restrained. A barrier is soon formed between the two who should have had perfect trust in each other. Then coldness and neglect follow and the husband is driven by the jealousy of his wife to find in other society which that which he cannot find at home and with his wife and children. Thank you. That's sad. I know if I have a friend who that happened to and uh, it destroyed their marriage. She was every, you know, going to the growth, going to the checkout line. And uh, after they would leave the checkout line from a grocery store, the woman would say, why did you talk to her like that? Why did you look at her like that? And and he was like, what? And you must like her. Why are you looking at her? <laughs> I mean, this went on and on and on to the point where he was, you know, so, you know, stunned by the even prospect of talking to a female because of what his wife would say to him after he came, after they were alone, came home and she would accuse him of all kinds of things. That destroys a marriage. That jealousy, that is a personal problem that needs to be overcome. And sadly, that couple divorced. It, it, couldn't, it couldn't continue on that way. That jealousy rooted in pride and insecurity. So what else does pride do to us? It causes anger towards others. It makes us critical, unloving, uncaring. I know another situation where, you know, every time uh, somebody came home, one person came home, they were always angry. And the family was running around walking on eggshells. And, you know, and kind of relieved when that, when that, you know, parent was gone. And it was very sad for the whole family. Pride gives one a feeling of superiority. What does that do to relationship? Well, that can put pressure on the other spouse because they feel like there's nothing I can ever do to make them happy enough. They need to have this, they need to have that. They have to have these clothes. They have to have that type of furniture. They have to have that type of car. And especially if you're the one that is making the money in the family and it could be man or wife and that pressure keeps coming on you that destroys a, that destroys a relationship and makes them makes one very resentful towards the other and 
the assumption of superiority pride causes. And that can cause embarrassment in a relationship. When one goes out and acts like they are superior to everybody else and the other, other spouse is, you know, just kind of ashamed at the behavior that they're seeing there. Pride causes a feeling of entitlement where the, where, a, where the other spouse might feel used, feel disrespected. Well, what am I here for? Am I only here for your paycheck, for paycheck to support your, your wants and desires? This is why the courtship period is a time to take your time and learn about that other person. There's not a big rush to get married. I know everyone, the people that want to get married, they're excited because of the wedding night. Okay, you know, and our whole life is going to be like the wedding night. No, it's not. <laughs> Things calm down and life starts. And then the truth of the characters comes out. And so these, these things are warning signs. Um, pride can cause lying and dishonesty. You know, as I was, I told you, I was watching a Facebook um, post about these people were talking about, well, where do you, where do you hide the things from your husband that you buy? And I said, why do you want to, why do you want to hide things from your husband? What spouse wants to be, have things hidden from them and lied to them and being dishonest to them? That's not, you know, that's not why we get married. So pride is kind of like a disease. It must be constantly fed by others. Um, so indulging in pride, what does it cause? It causes needless expenses. It causes always wanting more, something new. It causes discontent, not happy, not satisfied. Got to have something new. It, ca it need causes a need for others' approval, recognition. It causes self-exaltation. These are all qualities that won't be in heaven. So we want Christian lives, and these are qualities that we're seeing in our own lives, in our own homes. These are things that we need to, these are character issues, and these are character issues that need to be resolved through sanctification, through renewing yourself through with Christ. As long as we have the faith as long as we have the fruits and seeds of pride in our hearts and therefore in our marriages, we're always going to have problems in varying degrees in our homes. So as I was saying, I can't, you know, give you advice to solve all of your problems, but I will, but we will talk about this to correct these problems. We ourselves and hopefully our spouses will be on board with us. We need a total heart transformation and do a whole heart searching. We need a personal revival and spiritual revival and reformation. This is the fastest way to make changes in our homes. And even if your spouse isn't on board, you can start with yourself. And as they, as they see that you're changing, they'll be watching and you'll start noticing changes in your, in your home life, adjustments and so forth. But the first step is confession and repentance. If you're saying, you know, yes, we've had this in our lives. This is not, this is not, these aren't characteristics that'll be in heaven and we want to go. We want to be ready. Now is the time for spring cleaning cleaning that out of your lives. So the first thing you want to do is confession and repentance to your spouse and to the Lord. Both. Don't just confess to the Lord. Confess to your spouse too. Be honest. Be sincere. Seek and ask forgiveness. Ideally, do this together as a couple. Do it with your spouse but don't neglect that private prayer time that is so desperately needed. I think there was a thing here. Mrs. White says here, 
in this same article that I was reading you before. She says, secret prayer, which is too much neglected, uh, is this life of the Christian. Secret prayer, which is too much neglected, is the life of the Christian. How much time are you spending in secret prayer right now? That means, you know, we. I have one dear friend. She literally has a closet that she says something happens. She goes into her closet. You might not, you might not have a closet. I don't have a closet that I can do that here, but wherever you are, find a quiet place where you can go and spend time alone with the Lord. Let us, she says, Mrs. White says, let us go to God alone and fix our minds upon him, have everything else shut out and then draw by living faith, light and strength from the sanctuary. Let us not rise from our knees until we can rely on God's promises with an unwavering faith. Then we shall be benefited by secret prayer. Let me put this under the camera. Some of you might want to take a screenshot of that. Again, that is, that is Review and Herald, 1855, June 12th. And let me just show you where it is. It's right here, right there. Secret prayer, which is too much neglected, is the life of the Christian. Let us go to God alone and fix our minds upon him. Have everything else shut out. And then draw by living faith, light and strength from the sanctuary. Let us not rise from our knees until we can rely on God's promises with an unwavering faith. Then, then we shall be benefited by secret prayer. When you go to, when you go to the Lord in prayer, tell him what's going on. Not because he doesn't already know, because he does. He sees, he sees everything. He pays very close attention to our lives and what we say. But just pour your heart out to him. Tell him what's going on. Tell him how you feel. I know of a couple different ladies who were in very difficult marriages. And they finally got to the point where they said, they cried out, Lord, I can't handle this anymore. I need your help. There's, there's no one else to help me. I need your help. And they totally, they said, whatever it takes, Lord, to save our families, do it. I don't care what it takes. They couldn't, couldn't for whatever the reasons going on with their husbands in those situations, they couldn't talk to their husbands about it. Their husbands would not listen for various reasons. And so they were totally dependent upon the Lord. And the Lord, when once we come to that point, and he's waiting for us to come to that point. Sadly, we, we, we wait, we don't realize that. That's why I'm bringing this up. He's waiting for us to totally surrender our lives to him. And then, and Mrs. White says this, then he can work with us. But as long as we keep one, you know, one leg in the world and one leg in the church, and we're trying to str straddle the fence here, you know, with both, it's not going to work. The Lord's going to work with you once you totally surrender. Okay. And those who go to heaven will be in a totally surrendered um, condition. They won't have one leg in the world. The worldliness has to be eradicated from our lives. And so because of the time that we're living in, now is the time to do this. We don't know how long probation is going to last for us. We don't know how long we're going to live even. We may not even be here tomorrow. Um, so this is important work to do today. So ideally, confess and repent. Surrender your lives to Christ. And if you've done it before, do it again. She says we each need a personal spiritual revival and reformation. Remember the, the condition of Laodiceans is that they are, they are, they think they have everything and yet they're really poor, blind, naked and miserable and wretched. And so what is, so what is the counsel to us in these days? The Lord says, buy of me. This is Revelation 3.18, buy of me. And he says, the gold tried in fire, the white raiment, the, the eye salve. 
and you go, well, that sounds good, but what does that mean? When he says, Mrs. White says, when the Lord says, buy of me, that means be zealous and repent. What did, what did the Lord tell the Israelites in the Old Testament over and over when they were going away from him? They were telling him, he kept telling them, repent, return to me, and I will heal you. I will help you. And they kept going off over, over you know, off after, you know, pagan ways and worldly ways. But we're told the same thing in our day now in that in the church of the Laodicea. Uh, buy of me, she says, means be zealous and repent. Now, if you are zealous, you can't be lukewarm. If you're zealous, you are earnest, you are persistent, you are determined, you aren't, meh, I'll, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. No, if you're lukewarm, you won't be in heaven. God says he'll spew you out. We have to be zealous and repent. And then, buy, buy of me the ISAF. Pray for the ISAF. What is that? That's a spiritual discernment. That's going to help you see your character as you are. I don't think we talk enough about character. The, I read almost completely the scriptures and spirit of prophecy only. That's all I read. And I cannot tell you, every, almost every single article I read about, in, she says, she talks about the importance of our character. Our character is the only thing that is going to be tr the only thing that we're going to take with us to heaven. We're not going to get a new character when Jesus comes. I know there's people that who have been teaching that. That's not true. You don't get a Jesus when Jesus comes. He doesn't download a new character to you. No, that work has to be done now, each and every day. And that means so that spiritual discernment we want to pray for see ourselves as we really are you know see ourselves we may you know we're in a marriage in a marriage relationship we may not realize the things that we do but with that spiritual discernment you know it helps us see oh yeah i do do that that isn't really good i should i need to change that it gives you an eye opening it's kind of like um nicodemus when nicodemus went to see jesus we're told in the book of book called redemption when jesus when nicodemus went to see jesus at first he didn't understand the things that jesus was telling him but the but she tells us that after a while the it was like the scales fell off nicodemus's eyes and then he really understood who jesus was and what he was all about and what he was telling him we need to have those scales fall off our eyes so we need to pray for spiritual discernment. It isn't just going to be given to us. It isn't just, we don't get it because we go to church each week or we read our Bibles every day. That we have to pray for, ask for it. It'll help you to two things. See your character as you really are, and it will help you perceive sin and avoid it. So we need that, and we need the sanctification. That's the white raiment. That is the that is the purification of our souls. That's the sanctification, where we are being, our characters are being transformed, back to how we were before sin came in the world. So, because if you think about it, Jesus came to die. Jesus came and died for our sins, because the wages of sins is death. And so, therefore, we need to pray. We need to confess our sins, turn away from our sins, repent, ask forgiveness. And let's assume all those sins now are off the table. We still have our character, our sinful characters. And so that's what sanctification is all about. Our sanctification is all about changing our characters, changing our hearts. And again, we can't do that by ourselves. We have to ask Jesus to help us. And that is where we do struggle. We have to overcome our besetments, overcome our ways that aren't becoming. And that spiritual eyesight will point out to us things that we didn't even realize that we were doing that, that is not good, that is not Christian-like. And the, and the more you concentrate on it and pray for that Jesus's holiness to come into your heart, he will even get down to revealing motives that you have that are not good.
and you'll go, wow, I didn't even realize I had that motive. So that's why you need spiritual discernment. Um, and then you'll be tested. The gold tried in the fire, Revelation 3.18, is about faith and love as we're going through this total transformation of our hearts. And literally, you say, so what do I do? Pray. Lord, pray what David prayed. Create in me, Lord, a clean heart and restore a right spirit within me. And as you're going through this and you do things and you'll say, man, you know, I, I prayed, I, I keep doing this stupid thing I shouldn't be doing. And you'll get frustrated with yourself. Say, Lord, just take my human carnal heart out and replace your heart in me because we want to reflect Jesus's image. But it all starts with me. I can't change him. He can't change me. We can help each other. We can point out each other. We can encourage each other. But ultimately, that change of character is between us, each of us, and God. And, and submitting to the Lord's will to change us. Um, start actively. Uh, preparing yourselves to receive the seal of God. This is where I really found out, realized so much about the sanctification part. If you've never read the chapter in Testimonies, Volume 5, called The Seal of God, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's about 10 pages. I think it starts around page 210, 28. It goes about 10 pages. Read that chapter about the seal of God. The seal of God is more than keeping the Sabbath. It's about our character. There, no one is going to be going to heaven who has a sinful character. It is much more than just only believe and you're saved. That is, that's a different story, but we have to have that seal of God. And that seal of God is applied to us at the end of probation. That's what protects us through the time of tribulation, through those seven last plagues. If we don't have that seal of God, we will, by default, we will re end up with the mark of the beast. So you want to, you want to, rather than focusing on the mark of the beast, which we know what that is, you know, keeping Sunday and so forth, um, we need to be focusing on obtaining the seal of God. That's where our focus should be. So please read that. Uh, that's in Testimonies, Volume 5. Uh, it's around page 210 or so, about 11 pages. And so let me, let me just go on here. There's, I want to talk about one, something else that has come to our attention recently. And that is the whole fruit of the spirit called meekness. I don't know if you have ever studied meekness or what all that's about. We know Jesus uh, was very, says he was lowly and meek. And if he was lowly and meek, then he wasn't full of pride, was he? And he's our, and we think of, and we need to think about his life and what he did. And then think about our own lives. Are we following in his footsteps? Are we doing, are we reaching out to others? Are we converted ourselves? But he had a spirit of meekness. Now, if we are discontent with our surroundings or our circumstances, that's definitely not a spirit of meekness. In fact, look, if you look at Testimonies, Volume 3, page 334, it says in the council given testimonies, God places us where he chooses. Until he proves and tests us and we demonstrate our ability and fitness for a higher position. Did you ever think about that? Let me read that again. So this is Testimonies, Volume 3, three page 334. God places us where he chooses until he proves and tests us. And we demonstrate our ability and fitness for a higher position. So when we are discontented with our surroundings or circumstances, 
which have placed us where we might think our our duties seem to be too humble and too unimportant. We can be uh, restless, uneasy, dissatisfied. All this stems from selfishness. Are we desiring for more congenial labor? Something that we think, well, I'm better suited for that to do that. I shouldn't have to do this. I shouldn't have to, you know, do this meaningless cleaning work. God qualifies us at every level, keeps testing us. Are we not willing to work and wait in the humble place where he's placed us until he proves and tests us? So let's talk a little bit about meekness. Meekness is addressed in the Beatitudes. Just one second, my throat's really dry here. Hmm. Matthew 5 5 it says blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth now there's I have some notes here this was very interesting when we we did this study here recently in science of the times August 22 1895 it says the treasure of inward wealth that may be possessed in the midst of poverty and sorrow. That's what meekness is. You know, ladies, we like to get dressed up. We like to look nice when we go outside and have nice clothes on and, you know, nice, sometimes flashy things and adorn ourselves on the exterior. But that is not what God values. God values that inward adorning of our character. In Testimonies, uh, Volume 3, page 335, meekness is a precious grace. Willing to suffer silently, willing to endure trials, patient, labors to be happy under all circumstances, making melody in the heart of God. Meekness is not to be silent and sulky. I mean, you can be quiet and just be, you know, <laughs> silent and sulky. Meekness will suffer disappointment and wrong and will not retaliate. That is the process of sanctification on your character. When you can suffer disappointment and you can suffer wrong and you don't retaliate. That is the constraining power of the Holy Spirit working in your life to transform your life meekness is the most precious fruit of sanctification in fact it is the adorning and ornament of god's own choice it is a fruit of the spirit that is evidence that we are branches of the living god Speaking in the spirit of meekness, this is very interesting. You may never have heard this before. This is from, again, Signs of the Times, August 22, 1895. The adorning that is of value with God is a meek and mild spirit. And it is of more value than gold and silver and precious gems. Somebody with a meek and mild spirit. Now, meekness does not mean weakness. Think about Jesus when he went through his final hours before he died. He showed a spirit of meekness. He wasn't being weak. But he was very controlled. He didn't, he didn't respond to everything that they said to him. That they would throw at him. And you think to yourself... You know, if I went through that experience, could I could I be that self-controlled and not respond and not retaliate back, you know, when knowing they're about to kill me? Well, with Jesus, it was meekness that was controlling him. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that was controlling him. And think about that in your marriage relationships. There are things that 
uh, you both know that if you say or do, you know, pushes the other person's button, maybe intentionally, maybe not intentionally. But if you have that spirit of meekness in you, if you're going through the character, the daily character transformation of sanctification in your life, you'll find that things that used to bug you or bother you or where you would snap back at your partner about it, you'll find that it doesn't bother you anymore. That's the control of the power. That's the control of the Holy Spirit. And so think about that, where you might know you, you no longer are fighting back about things that you used to fight back about. Will that bring more peace in your home? Listening to the other person, you know, what, what are they really trying to say? Do they really, maybe they have a good point on what they're trying to communicate to you. Something that you didn't, never thought about or that your pride would say, that's not me. I'm not listening to that. Don't talk to me about that. No, that needs to go away. But that goes away with when we're surrendering ourselves to God and allowing his spirit to transform our hearts into the image of Christ. By the time that we go through, by the time that we are translated and go to heaven, let me just kind of back up and just kind of give you a, a series of steps that I've learned in my studies here. First of all, uh, if we've gone through this sanctification and confessed our sins and we're solid and the Lord gives us the, the, the seal of God, we are protected then through the plagues. But our, but our tests don't end there. While the plagues are, seven last plagues are falling upon people, we aren't just sitting there comfortably in some home just waiting for, you know, okay, there's number two, there's number three. Uh, okay, number four just happened. We're not going to be sitting back easily <laughs> on our laurels like that. We are still going to be, God is going to be still putting, be putting our characters through the fire of testing, through the fire of refinement. And Mrs. White said, I don't know where it is right now, but she, I read, she said that during those last times, during those last plagues is the time when our characters are going to be purified to the point where all worldliness will be completely out of our characters. So that the only thing left when, when Jesus comes is to have our physical bodies to be translated. And then we are ready to go to heaven. So what, is it, so what does it mean to get ready for heaven? It's exactly what I'm talking about. It's submitting ourselves now, today, to Christ. Surrendering our lives completely to him. I mean, think about that picture of the people going, the, the vision Mrs. White had. Of they're, going, they're going up that narrow path alongside that mountain. And they keep letting go of their belongings. They let go of the horses they let go of the carriage they throw all their suitcases overboard you know the farther they go in their journey the narrower and narrower that path gets that's the testing that's the refinement of your character and to finally the point where they can only walk safely in the person's steps footsteps that went before them and then finally all they have left is to hold on to these cords these big, huge cords that have come down that they're holding on to, those cords that represent, represent faith. If you're not going through a faith, going through situations where it's requiring you to have faith, get down on your knees and pray to God and ask for, you know, surrender your life and say, please start helping me. Because you don't want to be like the five foolish virgins where they were waiting for Christ to come and they were shut out because they didn't have that oil of the Holy Spirit with them. That's another whole study we could do. But the most precious, let me get back to meekness, the most precious inward adorning that we can have is the spirit is a meek and mild spirit. It is a more precious, more value than gold, silver, and precious gems. 
uh, meekness is the most precious fruit of sanctification, true sanctification. What is that? It is the entire conformity to the will of God. How do you know what the will of God is? I'll just tell you, read your Bible and read the spirit of prophecy. If you have access to the internet, you have access to all these tons and tons of articles that she's written. If you just sit and read those, you will learn so much in a very short period of time. Um, also, entire conformity to the rule of God. If you haven't read and studied Christ Object Lessons, I highly encourage you to do that. In fact, when, when God literally called us into doing this publishing work so many years ago, and when he did, the first, one of the first things he did I was like, oh, I had all these questions, but he impressed me, pressed upon me strongly, study Christ object lessons. And I thought, oh, okay. I never really studied it before, never read it before. Study it. And in fact, that's a great way to have, um, great way to have, um, what do you call it? Worship with your family. Start reading through them. It's, it's all about the parables of Jesus, but you're going to find in there, not only will you start to understand the parables, and you'll see how those parables all inter interweave with each other and the whole gospel message. You are going to find wonderful little gems of truth scattered through those parables that you've never heard probably in, in a sermon. And you're going to go, wow, I never knew that before. And But you're also going to find out what the will of God is for you. You're going to see things in, the, in that Christ Object Lessons things that he wants you to do he wants your you to do he wants your wife your husband to do your children to do and that you will you'll be like i didn't know that and we don't have much time left so i highly encourage you to learn the will of god through the bible and through um spirit of prophecy and uh definitely christ object lessons and also steps to christ if you haven't read that recently Please read it again. And don't just read it to say, okay, you know, I'm done. I read it. No, you got to go through slowly. Some of these paragraphs in the Spirit of Prophecy writings are so condensed. You can spend one paragraph, you can spend a half an hour on it, just reading it, talking about it. What does this mean? And the more you do that, the more and the more you're reading the Spirit of Prophecy and reading the Bible, you're going to get deeper insight into the Bible and spirit of prophecy than you ever had before. And when you're doing that, you're not going to have the interest in all these worldly things that used to take up your time. You're going to be, you're going to be going, I just never knew this was in here. It's, it's an awakening. It's a spiritual awakening. It says here in January, 1881, 1881. So it's January 18, 1881. The best adorned, the angels of heaven will register as the as best adorn those who put on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk with him in meekness and lowliness of mind. There's no pride there. And all the problems of pride, if you take on Jesus's character, those problems of pride that cause so many troubles in our lives and in our relationships will go away. That's why I'm talking about um, pride, character, meekness, sanctification as to help you in difficult marriages. It's getting to the root of the problem and eradicating it and taking on Christ's, um, Christ's image, his person, his character, which is God's character. Those who are truly connected with God will bear the fruits of of self-denial, self-sacrifice, benevolence, kindness, patience, fortitude, and Christian trust. Notice there's no selfishness in there. There's no self-exaltation in there. It says, though, daily they wrestle with evil and they are gaining victories and temptations over temptation and wrong. So yes, those truly connected with God, they will bear the fruits of self-denial, 
self-sacrifice, benevolence, doing good to others, being kind, patient, fortitude, and Christian trust. And that's and it's true what it says here. But that doesn't mean that you're still not going through your own personal struggles and your personal battles to tr to get victory over you know whatever other things have been accumulated in your life that you need to get victory over those things will still go on but you will be coming transformed and and changed the spirit of meekness will sanctify the soul what does sanctify mean it means to be make it holy the spirit of meekness will sanctify the soul and bring into subjection even our thoughts to Jesus Christ. You'll be removing yourself from the world. As we have great light from, from the heaven, as we have great light from heaven through God's message to us, we are required to walk in that light, as did Enoch. So the great light from heaven through God's message is from the Bible. It is from the spirit of prophecy. I know there's a, it's kind of popular these days for people to say, no, I only need the Bible. That's it. I don't need, I don't need the spirit of prophecy. Well, let me just tell you, God took up the entire life of one woman who started out as a very sickly child to give messages to us for these last days. And if we turn around and say, I don't need that. I only have, I only need the Bible. Do we know more than God? When you think about the parables of Jesus, some of them are only, some of them are only one, some of them, it's only, they're only one verse. But when you go to, you go to the Christ object lessons, which is part of the spirit of prophecy writings. She didn't make these things up on her own. And you see a whole chapter that's a gift from God. There are other, there are other um, Sunday worshipers out there that are, that when they see the, some of this thing from the spirit of prophecy, they're like, I can't believe this is out there. They have no idea. They're amazed. They're like, we never saw this before. And I have Sunday friends who share my spirit of prophecy things on Facebook to their friends because they love what they're reading. We should too. They were given to us. They're not, to, you know, it's kind of, if you think about it this way, now I'm in the United States, you're in uh, Kenya, but if I'm, if I want to go from one coast to another coast and I'm going to go visit my friend Denise and on the opposite coast of where I am. Now, for the most part, I can get there with a main roadmap, one, one document that shows the main uh, roads throughout the entire country. But when I get close to where she lives, I can't use that map anymore because it's not specific. It doesn't give me the details of the towns and of the little villages and of the little roads that, you know, go here and go there. So what do I need? I need a city map that's for that county. Think of the spirit of prophecy the same way. Yes, we have the Bible. We need the Bible. Absolutely. And that gives us the, you know, it's kind of like the big roadmap of, that, of the country. But the spirit of prophecy is given us to us in these last days. Think of it as that, as that um, city map. The map that you need to get to the final destination. Here we are. Jesus is about to come. We, are, we can tell that by, our, by the events going on around us. And we need to... We need to be studying the spirit of prophecy because it gives us the details that we need to know before Jesus comes. And if we neglect that, we're neglecting the spirit of God. The same spirit of God that inspired the people to write the Bible is the same spirit of God that inspired Mrs. White to write those write to write the writings that she did. We need to use it. It's a gift to us. It's a slap in God's face if we don't. And it's all there. It's online. We can read it. There's so much there. Let me continue on. 
Meekness is not to surrender our rights or to be a coward. It is the evidence we are becoming changed into Christ's likeness by faith. It is the preservation of self-control. It controls your it controls your behavior. It, it takes away that spirit of retaliation. Um, what happens when we don't have meekness? Mrs. White wrote this article, and uh, let's see, October eighth, eighteen ninety five. We don't have meekness. Jesus spoke about the Pharisees who thought themselves righteous above all men. They had a lot of pride. Um, let me see. I think. Do I have that here? Let me just. I want to read that to you. Uh, let me see if I have that here. No, I guess I don't have it here. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, wait, no, it is. Here it is. I do have it here. I want to read this to you. The Pharisees thought themselves righteous above all men upon the earth, but the Lord gave them a lesson that revealed their true spirit. Some who were present took the lesson to heart and avoided the course that he pointed out as being abhorrent in the sight of God. He came, Jesus came, to restore the moral image of God in man. And you know what? As Christ representatives, as Christian, rep as Christians, that is our job to do as well to the world around us. And that begins in the home. It begins in our relationships. Um. On another occasion, Jesus said, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Self-exaltation leads to the most inconsistent manifestations. This is pride. Those who indulge in this spirit may profess the name of Christ, but their acts of selfishness, inconsistency, put stumbling blocks in the way of sinners. And we shall never know in this world the mischief that is done by their inconsistent course. The absence of Christian humility and meekness is expressed in character. The more men neglect to cultivate these attributes, the more that we neglect to cultivate meekness and humility in our lives, the less they will manifest the character of Christ. And the more strenuous will be their efforts to exalt self. But the exaltation of self is a marked witness against, um, hold on, those who indulge in it. And in place of leading to exaltation, it leads to abasement. And he who would be highest in their self-exaltation, will find himself in the lowest position. Meekness elevates you. And of course, just like in typical Satan's patterns, is he likes to twist everything backwards, where make people think about pride is going to elevate me. No, it ends up, that ends up with you being at the bottom. It's the meekness of Christ that is going to elevate you. And it's going to help the relationships straighten out problems. Um, let me see here. And one last thing here I wanted to make sure. All need the wisdom to understand that it is true greatness to keep the company of Christ and walk in meekness and humility with God, cultivating a single-hearted simplicity and be ever ready to receive instructions from the great teacher. God has promised his Holy Spirit, which is sufficient to teach us, which if practiced, practice is a big word, is a frequently used word in the spirit of prophecy. We can't just be a listener and a believer. We have to be a doer. If practice, it will thoroughly furnish a man unto doing all good works. Um, how do we get meekness? 
you say you say well that sounds good i want that that might if that'll help my relationship help my home life help me to be a better spouse and better partner how do we get meekness listen to this this is from manuscript 94 1899 this is what i love about the spirit of prophecy if you keep studying you'll find the the how to's to do things what these things really mean and this is what it says the meekness and lowliness of christ is only learned by wearing christ's yoke okay it's learned by wearing christ's yoke so what does that mean she says the yoke signifies entire submission to christ it springs from fellowship with god how do you get, how do you wear Christ's yoke? Again, submitting entirely, surrendering yourself to Christ, surrendering yourself to God, asking him to make that total change of transformation in your life. That's where it comes from. That's what wearing Christ's yoke is. Entire submission to Christ, holding nothing back. And you know, it can be scary to say, but what about my job? What if what if I have to do this or what if I do that? You know what? The being in God's will is the safest place for us to be. And yes, you will be tested. Yes, you will be put in positions where you will say, I don't know what to do. I see no way out of this position. I have no idea what's going to happen. I am not in control. And you'll think, I don't like this. And you know what? you're in the best hands you're in god's hands because that is when when you have no when you are backed up against the wall and you have no way out and you are praying lord help me i don't know what to do i can't do anything here i need your help you're the only one who can help me and he will make you wait and wait but be patient it happens to all of us <laughs> be patient he will come through I will tell you from my own personal experience, when I, when I totally surrendered my life to Christ, um, holding nothing back, back around 2002, uh, I will tell you, I've been in many of those positions since then, and never once to this day has he let me down. I've been in positions where, one position once when I was down to my last $5, I mean, it sounds crazy, but that's what it was. And I was like, I don't know what we're going to do, Lord. <laughs> we're out here in the desert and we have no money left. And um, for various reasons, there's different circumstances going on. And uh, we were totally dependent on him. And uh, we prayed about it and kept praying, kept praying. Meanwhile, we had a roof over our head. We had a beautiful sunset every night. We had... You know, we had plenty of food. We were fine. Physically, our temporal needs were met. Um, but, you know, food was getting scarce. And we're like, Lord, you know, there's not much in the food in the thing. We need to we need to move on here. And, uh, you know, my husband said to me, did you check the safe there? And I'm like, yeah, there's nothing in there. And he kept saying it. Did you check the safe there? Yeah, there's nothing in it. Because I knew what was in it. And he finally said it again. I said, okay. I'm going to prove to you there's nothing in it. So I went, opened it up, moved some stuff around. And there was a white envelope in there. And I pulled it out. I thought, that's kind of funny. It's kind of, you know, it feels like something in there. It was $900 in there. We just sat and stared at each other. I, I know there was no money in there. But God will push you. Now, that's kind of an extreme example. I, I don't wish anybody to have to go through, but we had to go through. But we have had many, so many experiences like this where we have had to totally depend on the Lord and we didn't know what was going to happen. Just this week, this past week, was it Sunday now? Uh, Thursday. Thursday, they were telling my husband he had to go under oral surgery. And there was no way to help him. He was extremely sick. You probably, if you saw my Facebook page, you saw the comments. I was saying, please pray. He was extremely sick. We had to take him to the emergency room. And they helped him temporarily. And I believe it was your prayers that brought him through. 
because they were talking about, they said he's the only thing that's going to help him is surgery, cutting into his neck. Um, he had a really bad, deep abscess that, you know, just topical stuff wasn't going to help. And those prayers worked. He did get one other di different medicine, but Friday night he was doing a Zoom session. So prayers work, trust in God. He will put you through tests. And, you know, that was a situation where we're like, what are we going to do? We can't afford, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars surgery. We didn't have that um, type of money laying around and we didn't have in, in our insurance didn't cover it. And uh, the Lord will test you. And as he tests you and puts you through those things, you know what happens? It's like those cords on that uh, going on that um, that path, Mrs. White's dream going on that path next to the mountain where the road gets smaller and smaller and smaller. But as that happens, these cords are let down. You probably know the, the vision I'm talking about. The cords are let down and the cords get bigger and bigger. Those cords are cords of faith. So as you, and the farther they get up on that path, the bigger those cords get until finally, all they have to hold on to is that cord of faith because the path is gone. And they, she says in the vision, they say, what's holding these cords? And they say, it's God. So that's gonna happen to you as you progress down God's path and in his will. And, and the Lord may lead you to do make decisions that everyone around you will think is absolutely crazy. But you know what? You have to follow his way in faith and he will take care of you. And there was a time when I was having to downsize and, you know, I had all this stuff I had accumulated in the house and, and I was dragging my feet because I would look at things and I think, but I worked so hard for this. And because we were making a very major life change to be into a much smaller place to live. And I was like, uh, and I knew I couldn't take it with me. And I kept thinking about that vision where they had to keep letting go of their stuff along the way. And, um, and that's what actually allows me to be, do what I'm doing now, because had I not, I wouldn't be able to even, I wouldn't even be doing this. But uh, at one point in time, the Lord said to me, I was by myself in the, in the bedroom looking around. He said, okay, make your decision now. He said, do you want your old life? Or are you going to follow me? And I knew in my mind's eye what my old life would be, going back into healthcare, doing the same old thing I'd done before. And he said, or follow me. And in my mind's eye, it was black. I couldn't see anything. And I thought, no, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I believe in you because it was like, this is where the rubber meets the road. We say we have faith. We say that we believe what God says. We say we believe the Bible, but someday it's going to hit you right in the face. Do you really believe this? Because the next step you take is going to prove if you believe it or you're going to go back to your old ways. And so I said, okay, Lord, I, I believe you. I know all of the things you have done for me in my life, all, every step of the way. I know you won't let me down now. And he hasn't. And he won't let you down either. Just a few more things here about relationships. Now, this is kind of the spiritual aspect, but I want to share with you some practical aspects. Also, I would encourage you all to read Adventist Home. You can, do you can download that if you don't have a hard copy of it. Read, read Adventist Home, read it together, even if you're married. And if you're thinking about getting married, read it together. Very good, very good preparation for that. But um, I had some other notes here. Let me see if I can quickly find them for you that I wanted to, just things, practical things I wanted to mention regarding relationships. And uh, that's not it. I'm sorry. I should have that better for you. Um, 
Well, here's here's a few of them. Okay, I can share these with you. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you know, and you're if you're in, if you're in difficult relationships, and even if you're not in a difficult relationship, think about today as drawing a line in the sand with your partner, with your spouse. Recommit to one another. Confess your sit down together apart where you're alone. You know, look into each other's eyes. I asked somebody one of the best, I asked uh, on my Facebook page, the best advice. And um, I think my friend Cindy said is to forgive one another. And then another friend, uh, uh, what's her first name? Scott Moore's wife said to listen to one another. And that's very true. We need to listen to one another. So I would suggest the first opportunity you can with your spouse, sit down with them privately, quietly, in a quiet place. Recommit yourselves one to another. Confess your faults to each other and ask for forgiveness. Be honest, be sincere. And then together, ask God for forgiveness where that needs to be asked for. After, con after confessing your sins to him together, pray together, come together, you know, just like when you, came, when you got married. Ask him to become back as being the center of your marriage. And, as, and a spiritual revival, you've heard the words revival and reformation. And they, people usually say them really quick, revival and reformation. Well, revival is a spiritual revival, an awakening, a renewal. But it's no good if it's not followed through without a reformation. That's the actions. So this part is kind of the revival part. You're recommitting yourself. You're waking and saying, no, we need to get on the right track here, honey. There is not much time left for you and me and the kids. We need to get on God's path. But you need to do the reformation part too. Just sit there with, quietly with your spouse. Do an inventory of your lives. What things are in the home that need to be changed? What things in your home are godly? What things in your home are worldly? What needs to change? What needs to go out? You might do exactly like I did years ago with, with, the, with a couple of big old black trash bags in my hand. And I went through room by room and I looked around and I thought, okay, what is godly and what is not godly? What is basic needs and what is definitely not godly? And I filled up, I had to do it three times. I had to go through the kids' rooms, search everything out. Um, you know, things creep into your house and you don't, and you look at it and you realize, ooh, this, sh this book should not be here. That CD should not be here. And I filled up three trash bags doing that years ago. Start worshiping daily together. And don't neglect your personal worship time, your personal time with the Lord. He's waiting for you. He, he's not the one that moves. He's not the one that goes away. We're the one that drifts away. We get distracted and we forget and, well, we don't have time and we need to make that a priority. Um, uh, just some thoughts for the ladies. Then I have some for the men too. Surrender and consecrate your life to Christ every morning. Consecrate. Remember what it said in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4? Those, the Lord's going to use those people to finish the work in the third angel's message who humble themselves and consecrate themselves daily. Ladies, we can meet, we can reach many, many people that our husbands will never come in contact with. And people will listen to us. And so we are needed to be speaking up, speaking for the truth, speaking, warning the world. The message, the three angels message is not a message of hope as, 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 is, as is often stated. It is a message of warning. In fact, you may, I don't know if you've heard this before. This is why it says that the third angels message that's supposed to be going out right now is the most solemn message ever um, ever entrusted to humans since the beginning of this world. 
Let me repeat that. She said the giving of the third angel's message is the most solemn message of mercy and of warning ever given, ever, ever bestowed on humans to give to the world since the beginning, beginning of this world. That means our duty to give the third angel's message to the world is even more significant than Noah's. Now, can you imagine that? That your duty and my duty to warn the world, to explain the three angels' messages, to explain you have a case in heaven right now that's being decided about you, and to tell them, warn them, you know, Jesus is coming soon. There's that your your case is in the judgment now, and especially tell them, warn them about the Sabbath, explain the Sabbath, and warn them about keeping all of God's commandments, especially and, and especially the Sabbath, because those who refuse and neglect it will receive the mark of the beast. They will incur the full wrath of God. That's a warning. That's not a message of hope. That's a message of warning. The message of mercy is now respond to that, respond to that call to people, you know, t teach them what that means to their lives. And basically everything we're talking about today fits it right in with it. It's the confessing our sins, repenting of our sins, asking Jesus to change our hearts, prepare us because the time of Jesus is coming is close. We may, we may not live till tomorrow. We may live until Jesus comes. We don't know. But we each have a responsibility. If we have that understanding of that truth, God expects each one of us to share that with other people. There was something else I wanted to say too. Oh, the value of a soul. This is why it explains to us, um, again, I don't remember where it is, but um, the value of a soul so when you're out there and you're going to talk to, you're going to go to the grocery store, you're going to go pick up somebody or you're driving or whatever. And you look around and you think, okay, well, who do I talk to? And you see this person and you see that person and you see this person and you, you're thinking, well, they wouldn't want to listen to me because whatever, they look this way or they wouldn't want to listen to me because, you know, they're busy. And think about that soul perishing. Now, let me tell you the value of a soul. We're told that the value of a soul, one soul, is worth more than all the riches of the world. So when you see that one person over there that you're like, eh, I don't know if I should talk to them or not. Remember that. The value of one soul saved is worth more than all the riches of the world. If they were the only person that jesus that would be saved because of jesus's death he would have died for that one person can we afford not to talk to people and as you are recommitting your life to christ and getting deep into a relationship with you with him you're going to find that your your need you're going to find that you're wanting to reach out to people we are our brother's keeper we're told we're not living this life just for our own glory or pleasure or gain or anything else. We are here. If we're Christians, we are here to be as representatives of Christ. And it's really been hitting me more and more lately how closely we need to walk in Christ's footsteps. Um, so, yes, the, both ladies and men surrender and consecrate your life to your to our father every day pray for wisdom james james 1 um, verse 5 and 6 pray for wisdom and understanding pray for guidance in your day pray throughout the day as you are praying and the lord's going to do something he's going to start reminding you of sins that you have not forgiven you have not repented of i had this happen uh, a couple years ago I was waking up, and as I was waking up, I saw like a white sheet come down in front of my face. So I was awake, but I hadn't opened my eyes yet. 
I saw this white sheet come down and it had spots on it, black spots. And I, in my mind, I was like, what is that? Because it was like this close to me. <laughs> and, and the Lord impressed me. Those are sins you haven't, you haven't repented of yet. And I gasped. I was like, what? And I was shocked. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, I thought I had repented of all the sins of my life. So I prayed and said, Lord, show me what these are. I don't remember. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not 25 years old anymore. I don't remember. And so over time, the Lord brings things to my memory that, oh, remember you did this? Remember you did that? And uh, when that happens to you, pray and, and ask for forgiveness because we can't have any spots or blemishes on our record in heaven when our name comes up for that judgment. We need to have everything confessed and repented of so Jesus can blot out those sins with his blood and say, and have next to those sins on your name pardoned. So when that happens, these things, I have a good friend of mine, he was telling me, he was telling us a few months ago, he says, yeah, I drive around a lot and I kept, these things keep coming to my mind of things I did in my past. He says, and finally the Lord impressed upon me, these are sins you haven't forget, you haven't repented of. <laughs> he kept thinking, boy, it's interesting that these things come to mind. Well, the Lord was trying to get his attention. So when that happens to you, as I'm sure it will happen to everybody, stop and pray and ask for forgiveness of those sins. You don't want any sins on your record um, that you've done that, that aren't repented of. And ask the Lord to, re to bring them to your memory so that you can see them and, and repent of them. Ask God to create in you a new heart. Like David, create in me a new heart, O Lord, and create a right spirit in me. And uh, lastly, I'm just going to leave you with this because I know it's about one o'clock here. Parents, teach your children by example what an example of a Christian husband is, a Christian wife, a Christian home. Even if yours isn't perfect right now, as you're, you're striving to make changes, teach your children think about this would i want my child to marry a spouse like me and if you say mm, no then you need to make changes All, and also the other thing too is i just wanted to mention regarding men there's a lot of problems with um young people being very promiscuous and getting involved with the other sex um, sexually when they're young. One of the ways, men, that you can really help impact that is start taking your daughters out on a regular basis, like when they're 12, 13 years old, one-on-one, -on -one, like a daddy-daughter date, and on a reg maybe once a month, start developing a good, strong uh, bond with that young lady teach her what a young a proper young man uh should treat her like treat her how show her talk about these things with her when she's younger and going through her teens so that so that when she's so she's comfortable coming and talking to you about the situations that she's going to go through in her teens rather than somebody else and so that through your example in in, uh, you know, taking her out, opening the door for her, showing her how a, a man treats a woman, uh, you know, a young lady, and, and explain to her, these are good things, these are bad things. But uh, as it's been proven that as if men do this with their daughters, as they're growing up, that tendency to be promiscuous and getting sexually active in, at a young age goes way down. So I just wanted to throw that out. Much can be prevented by that strong dad relationship with his daughter. And likewise, sons and sons and moms, they talk a lot anyway, but moms, see, see the thing is, is moms, moms and dads, we're both young boys and girls. And so give your children that wisdom that you recognize from when you grew up. 
and tell them and so that they have the knowledge and they have the warnings. So when they encounter those situations, when you're not around, they remember what you said. And hopefully they will take your, you know, take your advice of what you taught them. But that is, that is one suggestion for men that, um, and I actually had my husband do that with our daughter. I told him about that. And uh, I think it really did help too. So with that, I know we're out of time. There's more, I have so much more here I could tell you. Um, but I think we're probably gonna have to close up now because it is one o'clock. Um, are, are there any questions or comments? I wanna thank you all for being so patient and listening and considering what I'm saying. Anybody have anything to share or say or? <laughs> I think you're all there. If not, oh, I see. Yes. Um, so what, if I'm correcting this right, by keeping ourselves closer to God, it's going to improve our marriage if it's having problems. It's going to change you more to the likeness of Christ, which is going to help 